I would ask that you would now turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. As we continue to make our way through this gospel account, this morning we'll be focusing on verses 1 through 3, though I'll be reading 1 through 14 for the overall context. A new section, though it is still part of a narrative that continues in terms of chronology, immediately after what we saw at the end of chapter 13. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Let's give careful attention to the reading of God's most holy and infallible word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know that, or excuse me, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves." Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You've all heard the expression, there's no place like home. Now, some of you probably also recognize where that comes from. Probably the most popular version of that expression is from the movie, The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. Now, in general, all of our homes have some measure of dysfunction. They do. We need to be honest about that. And even the best of godly homes will have that measure of dysfunction within it. And yet, despite all that, there is a sense that when we go through hardships, whether it's in this area or that area, in the workplace, extended family, vacations even, there's a certain sense where we almost wish and we long for the comfort of home because it is familiar, it is a place of solitude, it is a place where we feel in a sense, protected. Now, of course, I recognize there are sad instances where that is not actually the case for some people, and I don't want to minimize that, but we are speaking what, the way things ordinarily are, the way things even should be. No place like home. And for you and me, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, There really is no place like home. And it's not here on this earth. It is the home that the Lord Jesus Christ prepares a place for us. And that's what we'll be focusing on in these verses. Now, John 14, it's an interesting dilemma because there's a chapter break here, obviously, because we're looking at the first three verses. And there is, of course, debate whether or not there should be a chapter break because 
chronologically, it falls right on the heels. It, it's almost as if Jesus didn't even take a breath, but he's continuing from the end of chapter 13 right into chapter 14. And so some scholars think it is wise to, that maybe there shouldn't have been a chapter break here. On the other hand, there are good arguments for putting a chapter break here because what we see in chapter 13 particularly is much more conversational. Jesus certainly has a lot to teach us. As we took a number of weeks to go through chapter 13, we saw that. But there was a lot of back and forth. Now, there is some back and forth from chapter 14 through chapter 16, but predominantly what we see here is much more discourse. In fact, most of the conversation happens in these first, this first half of chapter 14. The rest of it, and you see even in chapter 15, the entirety of chapter 15 is the Lord Jesus speaking. So there's discourse here. Regardless, we are in a position where it is mere hours before Jesus is arrested, before Jesus is brought before Pilate, and then soon thereafter crucified. Jesus has been telling his disciples that he must be going. And where he goes, they cannot follow. And we've, we've talked about this and the reality of the fact that Jesus is going to do that which his disciples and no other Christian could do. Go to the cross and atone for the sins of his people. That was something that Jesus alone could do. And he just got done telling Peter in particular, you can't go. And even though Peter said, you say I can't follow, but I'll lay down my life for you. And so we have the prediction, the sad prediction, the foretelling of Peter's own denial, which we will get to in due time. But here we come to a point where Jesus begins here in chapter 14, and really does continue all through chapter 16 in providing the basis for the comfort of his people in the absence of Christ. As strange as that may sound, Jesus is about to go. And much of what we see in this, these few chapters demonstrates for us Christ's comfort for his own people specifically to the disciples in the time that they are about to face, but also for you and for me as Christians as we deal with the realities and the hardships of a world that hates the kingdom of God, that hates the Lord Jesus Christ, and hates the church. So what I hope to show from this text, from verses 1 through 3 this morning, is simply this. Jesus comforts us by reminding us of what he has prepared for us. Jesus comforts us by reminding us of what he has prepared for us. We're going to look at this under three headings and really verse by verse. First of all, we're going to look at the disciples' hearts. Secondly, we'll look at the father's house. And then finally, the son's return. So first of all, the disciples' hearts. Look again at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Your hearts is actually, and this is kind of odd in English, but the subject of the sentence, for you who love to look at grammar, the subject of the sentence is your hearts. And so we have what's known as, and to be somewhat technical here, a third-person imperative. That's something we don't do in English. Our imperatives, our commands, our instructions are always second person. You, you. Sometimes it's plural, but modern English, we don't do the the, ye distinction. But here we have a third person imperative. Your hearts must not be troubled. And so, let not your hearts be troubled is a good translation. It works, but it, it does tend to lose the force of what Jesus is trying to say. Your hearts are not to be troubled. It's more than an expression of, hey, 
It'll be okay. And as true as that is, as Jesus proved, it was all okay in the end. Jesus is saying much more. And see, you and I ought to identify with the disciples at this point very clearly because you and I, in difficult circumstances, have a natural inclination to have a troubled heart. We need to be honest. Things get to us. They cause worry. They cause angst, if you will. And in fact, the word here for troubled, as the ESV has it, it actually carries the connotation of something that is agitated, even physically agitated. It carries the idea of something wrestling inwardly. Have you ever had that kind of angst in your own life where in your heart of hearts you were very agitated and you were dealing with difficulties and struggles? It keeps you from sleeping. It keeps you from eating. This tends to be our natural inclination. And yet it should not be. And yet we need reminding time and time again not to worry, not to be anxious, not to let our hearts be troubled. I mean, after all, this is what Paul says when he says to the Philippians, be anxious about nothing. Be anxious about nothing. But what's the remedy? How do we deal with it? Well, Jesus tells us. You look here at the second portion of verse 1, believe in God, believe also in in me. Now, some of you may notice that there's a footnote next to believe in God. And you see that the footnote indicates that it could be, or you believe in God, believe also in me. This is not actually a case of a textual variant. It really is a translation issue. And interestingly enough, in our own English word for believe, we can see how this works. The declarative statement, you believe. The command, believe. You notice how the spelling's identical. It's actually a little bit easier in English for us to determine whether or not the verb believe is being issued as a declarative statement or whether or not it is a command. Because in English, we almost always preface the declarative statement with the noun in front of the verb, you believe. You don't have to do that in Greek. And so the spelling in the Greek for the verb in terms of being a declarative statement or a command is identical. Now, of course, like in English, not all words do the same thing. But here's a case. And so this is not one of these textual variant issues that this manuscript has, has it one way and that manuscript has it another way. It's a question of translation and interpretation. Regardless of which sense you take, both are probably true. If you take it as Jesus saying declaratively, you believe in God, that's understandable because, remember, in chapter 13, after Judas left, what did he call them? Little children. Christ recognizes that they do believe in God. On the flip side, you can take it as a command, that this is his encouragement. This is what you need to do. Believe in God. Believe in me also. Whatever the case may be, there's a stress here on faith. Believe in God, or you believe in God. Christ is acknowledging either that they do believe in God or is reminding them to continue doing what they have been doing, believing in God. You and I need those reminders over and over and over again. And it's so simple. And sometimes it becomes so trite and rote that somebody says, you need to have more faith, and it just annoys you. 
Yet the fact of the matter is, we probably do need to have more faith. Now, there is wisdom in knowing when to say that, to be sure. After all, we think about Job and his three friends. The wisest they were when they sat with him for seven days and didn't say anything. But there are times where you and I need to have that admonishment to have more faith, believe in God, believe also in Christ. Believe also in me is what Jesus tells them. The question of the form applies here also. Nevertheless, it is highly doubtful. It is highly doubtful that you believe in me is what Jesus is saying. Here, there's no question. I just cannot see it being anything other than an imperative in that second portion. Believe also in me. It stresses for us the importance of faith. As a Protestant church, as a Reformed church, we understand that faith is the alone instrument of our justification. We are declared righteous in God's sight through our faith. But faith is also an instrument in our sanctification. It is an instrument by which the Lord continues to flow grace into us. That grace to enable us not to have troubled hearts. Believe also in God. Now, of course, the object of our faith matters. Even in Macy's, some friend of mine on Facebook posted a picture of a sign that was in Macy's. Give, love, believe. Okay. Our faith, our believing, has an object. There is an object of our faith. Believe in God, not just some nebulous believe. Believe in the goodness of mankind, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Believe in yourself again. Believe in God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through our faith that the Lord gives us the grace we need to help us to overcome that troubled heart, that agitated heart. Now, I realize there are any number of reasons why our hearts could be agitated. But in the context here, it's the idea that Jesus is now going to be gone. He's going to be departing. And the disciples who elsewhere have said, we've given up everything for you. What's next for them? Well, Jesus will answer that in greater detail, particularly in the second half of the chapter. But for now, what Jesus does is he points them to the end first. He goes to the end of the book and gives away the ending, if you will to give them the comfort that they need. And that brings us then to our second point, the Father's house. Look now at verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Somewhat woodenly, the beginning of verse 2 is translated something like this. In the house of my Father. And it's important to note that Jesus is very careful here. He does this elsewhere. But he doesn't say, in your father's house. He doesn't even say, in our father's house. But he says, in my father's house. That's an expression of uniqueness. It is certainly true that through Jesus Christ, on account of what he's accomplished for us, we are adopted into his family and therefore have a right to call God Father. But as Jesus elsewhere distinguishes, he says, my Father and your Father. Well, it's the same Father. 
What does he mean by making such a distinction? The difference is simple. For you and for me, God's fathership, if you will, our sonship, is based on adopting us. For Christ, as to his essence, as the second person of the Trinity, he is eternally begotten of the Father, even as we confessed earlier with the Nicene Creed. He is of the same substance with the Father. In that sense, you and I could never be like Christ. And hence this distinction. And so my Father, in his house, Christ's Father has a house. We ever think that through? The Father has a house. And you see, it's more than just a mere residence, a mere place where you rest your head, although that's certainly part of it. It's the abode of a family. The home where, is where ordinarily we understand the family to be centered. Which tells us, even implicitly, that what awaits us is the Father's house and he welcomes us into his home as his children. You see, Jesus is pointing to the end. He gets right to the end to bring comfort. It is the abode of family. And notice that in this house, there are many rooms. It's important to note that all of this, in this discussion of the Father's house, in which there will be many rooms, is all part of the comfort which began with, let not your hearts be troubled. Here's the reason why your hearts must not be troubled. In the Father's house, in Christ's Father's house, there are many rooms. God's house, his dwelling, his abode, ultimately is in heaven itself. What Jesus says here is for the comfort, as Jesus is soon going, and for you and for me, Jesus is not physically present. And what keeps you and I going is the reality that the Father's house has many rooms. Many rooms for you and for me. You know, we live in a generation that nowadays many kids grow up with their own rooms. A generation ago or maybe two, you would squeeze any number of kids in one room. You're going to have your own room in heaven, as it were. In the Father's house, there are many rooms. It implies that many will be there. Granted, Scripture often speaks in language of remnant. But the book of Revelation speaks of numbers that no man can count. Think of the promise given to Abraham. Look above you. Look at the stars. Can you count them? That's going to be your descendants. Many rooms. That must be some mansion. These many-roomed house, mansion, they're not there for mere decoration. I can remember seeing a movie many years ago. I'll grant that it was a superhero movie. But one of the characters was extremely rich, and he lived in a mansion. And so he was having dinner with the girl he was interested in, and she said, do you eat in here often? And he was eating, and he said, I don't think I've ever been in this room. It was sort of humorous, 
But in God's house, there will be no empty rooms. Every room will be filled because the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says, will prepare it. He goes to prepare it. Now, the ESV here in verse 2, it has the second part as a question, and it works. But the footnote is probably more accurate. If you look at the footnote, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place to you, for you. So the Lord Jesus is going to prepare a place. And part of what he has to do in order to prepare that place is to go to the cross. There's a sense that not only is Christ preparing a place for you, he's also doing what is necessary for you to be prepared for the room. He goes to prepare a place, but he also goes so that you would be prepared to enter in. This is why he is going. This is why the disciples cannot follow. Though he has appointed them as apostles, capital A, apostles, messengers, heralds of the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot do what Christ alone can do. Prepare his people. Prepare the place in heaven for them. Only he can do this. Only by his obedience, even to the point of death on a cross. This, my friends, is how he prepares a room for you. For you who believe. And all of this comes through faith. Harkens us back to verse 1. Believe in God. Or you believe in God. Believe also in me. Faith being that instrument, that pipeline through which the grace of Christ flows. Our confession makes it clear that faith is also an instrument in our glorification. Christ is speaking of that day when they will be in the room prepared for them. By faith, we're justified. By faith, we're sanctified. And by faith, we'll be glorified. Let not your hearts be troubled. But as we'll see, even in the progressing weeks, the intervening time is preparation for you and for me. And so Christ's words of admonition to his disciples applies to you and me as well. As the church faces persecution, faces hatred, oppression because of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ, our desire to worship him and serve him alone, the world will throw everything it has against us. And Christ tells you, your hearts must not be troubled. For even now, Christ is preparing a place for you. That's the hope that we have. That's the confidence that we have. And so, my friends, you no longer have any reason, no ultimate reason to let your hearts be troubled. Will your hearts be troubled from time to time? Yes. We're weak. We struggle. We deal with sin. The world can be a scary place, especially against those, against those who affirm the name of Christ. But be that as it may, in the end, you have no ultimate reason to fear. Christ is preparing a place for you in his Father's house welcoming you into his family. Well, this brings us then to our third and final point, the son's return. Look now at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. 
And if I go. Now see, on the surface, that could be read from a grammatical standpoint as there's doubt. Well, I'm not sure, but if I go. But we could also use that expression as a logical conclusion. It's something that's certain. And so the logical conclusion of if I go, something's going to happen. Christ has already told his disciples that he is going. It is certain. It is sure. And so what's the conclusion? That's what Jesus is building up for. And so he says, if I go. And so the implied assumption here is, and I am. Or you can word it this way, and you know that I am because I've already told you that I am. If I go. Something else here is in view. It's not just the preparing of the place. You see, that would be unnecessarily redundant. And we know, we understand that there are times in Scripture where we see this redundancy. We've seen it in the Psalms. We've seen it even in John's Gospel. But Jesus has something more in view here. He's going to prepare a place But now Christ is promising something even more. If I go, and I am going, because I told you I was going, I will come again. It is as sure as his going. Repeatedly, Christ has been warning his disciples, preparing his disciples, I am going. In fact, we remember as we looked at that, as Jesus talked to Peter about this, that Jesus had told this to the Jews in chapter 7 and again in chapter 8, I am going. But his going means he's preparing a place. But his going also means in preparing a place for you and for me, he's going to come back so that he can take us to the place he prepared for us. He will come again. It is as sure as his going to prepare their place that he will come again. He's preparing them now so that when it happens, they'll believe that he will come again. They're struggling in the moment that Jesus is going. They don't get it, and their hearts are troubled over this. You think back in somewhat in an analogous way to chapter 13, verse 7. When, when Simon Peter asks Jesus, why are you washing my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And then you jump again to verse 19. Speaking of what has transpired or what the, the promised betrayal, the foretold betrayal of Judas, what Jesus says in verse 19, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. So in a similar fashion, what Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this now, my disciples, before it happens, before I actually go, so that when I do go, you may believe the rest of it as well. Not just merely say, wow, Jesus was right. He was going. That's part of it, to be sure. But the reality is that what Jesus is trying to do here is to get them to believe that when this happens, as he foretold, that everything else that he foretells will come to pass, specifically that Jesus will come again. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus warned you there would be oppression, that men would hate you because of his account. And as that progresses and as you see that happen in the everyday, it fulfills what Jesus himself promised. But that, my friends, ought to actually give you hope because everything that Jesus says will come to pass, including he will come again. 
He will come again. And in the meantime, he's preparing a place for you. Jesus went. He left. He went to the cross. He went to heaven. He's ascended on high. If those things that Jesus predicted, foretold, actually took place, then you could be assured that everything else he said that we have yet to see will be something that one day we will see. Let not your hearts be troubled. Christ is coming again. I will come again. Christ is going from the perspective of the disciples here, but he's promising them in the end, He's going to return. And so the disciples are being told the end story here. As we progress through chapter 14 and 15 and 16, Christ will talk about, well, what do we do in the meantime? But for now, the foundation of our hope, the foundation upon which you and I stand, that our hearts not be troubled, is that Christ is coming again. Christ is coming again. We know from the rest of scriptures what that entails. He will judge the living and the dead. He will usher us home to the Father's house. And we think about how awesome that is. We're going to be in heaven where there's no more death, no more dying, no more sickness. Of course, we love to speculate, what what will I look like in heaven? Will I have a young body, old body? Who knows? We'll have a body without the defects, without the aches and pains, but we'll be in heaven. But even that's not all that Jesus says. You look at the rest of verse 3. I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. It's not just that Christ comes again. It's that he takes you. The good shepherd takes his sheep. He takes you. He takes you to himself. It's not like he takes you and puts you in a bag somewhere and carries you. He takes you to himself. He gathers you. And notice that part of the purpose in this is that where I am, you may be also. Christ wants us to follow him forever. This is the purpose, the result even, of his coming again, that where I am, you may also be. The expression where I am seems to be somewhat emphatic, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the promise. We will be with Christ. The Puritans, reflected a lot on heaven, quite a bit. What what Jesus is speaking of here is more than eternal life, as odd as that may seem. I mean, isn't that the goal? Eternal life? Isn't that the goal of our salvation? But the Puritans, as though they reflected on the beauty of eternal life and heaven. They kept their eyes heavenward. What made heaven heaven was the presence of Christ. That's what makes heaven heaven. It's not merely the lack of illness, the lack of sickness, the lack of death. No more sadness, no more grief. All wonderful things but it is the place where Christ gathers his own. Heaven is heaven because of Christ. 
And there he gathers us. There we are where he is. And see, my friends, that's part of the reason why our corporate worship service should be something that is so attractive to us. Because we do often speak of God condescending and meeting with us, and that is true. But we tend to have this mindset that he comes down The reality is that spiritually, that is by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are lifted up. And so what we are experiencing here, gathered as God's people, redeemed by Christ, is a foretaste of heaven in the presence of Christ himself. That's why we come, to get a foretaste of being with Christ. Yes, it's true. We don't see him. We have the eyes of faith, as it were. But as Christ has promised his disciples, so he promises to you. He will come again and take you to himself that you may be where he is. And faith becomes sight. That's the beauty of all of this. Heaven is heaven to us because Christ is there. Christ is with us. It is the ultimate fulfillment of the name he has given, Emmanuel, God with us. And as John sees at the end of Revelation, he hears from heaven, now the dwelling place of God is with men. And that, my friends, is through the ever-present reality of Christ among his people. Christ with us. Why then should our hearts be troubled? Yes, life is hard. It's difficult. But because of Christ and what he promises, Everything in between will get through because Christ is preparing a place for you, a room for you in his Father's house. You'll dwell with Christ. You will dwell in Christ with the triune God. That's what the tabernacle and the temple foresaw. They were types to prepare us that there would be a time where God would dwell in the midst of his people. One of the wonderful, unique things about Christianity, aside from the reality compared to all other religions, is that it's true is that compared to all other religions, God came and made his dwelling amongst his people. And God the Son, the exalted mediator, will come again and we will dwell in his home. Why do I say, let not your hearts be troubled? Well, first of all, it was Jesus who said it, not me. But more importantly, it's because Jesus, the one who said it, is coming again. I can tell you Jesus is coming again, not because I'm saying it, but because he said it. And as true as it is, as he demonstrated to his disciples, he was going. They saw him go to the cross. They saw him ascend to heaven. That he fulfilled those things is proof positive that he will fulfill all things. Christ will come again and give us the room that he prepared in his Father's house to those who believe in God, to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our faith has kind of two aspects to it. We believe in God. We believe in Christ. 
But the other side, as R.C. Sproul would say, following other theologians, it's more than just believing in God because the demons believe in God. It's believing God. It's believing Christ. Christ said it. That's it. You've seen those bumper stickers or those catchy slogans. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's wrong. Take that middle one and put it on the end. God said it. That settles it. I need to believe in it. It's settled whether I believe it or not. But because I believe it, what he has promised, what he has said, will flow down to us. It will flow to us through Jesus Christ. He will come again. So my friends, let not your hearts be troubled. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in God in heaven, how we give you thanks for your word and the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave to his disciples that apply to you and to me, that our hearts need never be troubled. Lord, increase our faith. May your spirit work in our hearts that we would have greater faith, that we would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ more, that we would recognize that Christ has gone to prepare a place for us and that he will come again and take us to himself, that he may dwell with us and we with him. We pray all this in his name. Amen.